Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning everybody last class we looked at the uh, uh, non normality of thermoacoustic system we uh, found that this operator here uh, uh, is actually non normal and which uh, results in uh, this uh, non orthogonal eigen modes and we saw that if you have a system where the eigen modes are decaying even as the decay you can end up having growth in, in short term this is called transient growth and then we saw that uh, uh, we, we saw with both with parallelogram law and triangle law and then we said that um, if the transient growth is high enough then nonlinear instabilities will become important and then you can have nonlinear instabilities. So this is where we stop and then we are going to look at the re tube model. So uh, one way you can look at it is from the uh, dynamic system point of view they think of a basin boundary so you can think of this green potato shaped object as like a basin boundary and you can see along some direction for example if you want to go along this axis it takes a large kick to get out and um, to be outside the basin boundary. So anything outside this basin boundary will eventually come to this curve which is symbolic of the limit cycle but if you are uh, maybe inside just inside the dimple which may not be very far from the origin at all it may need just a very small disturbance to get out into this area of dimple and then you can really go out to limit cycle we look more carefully at how it does. So this has something to do with the topology of the phase space or geometry of the phase space and so on. So this that is a cartoon which illustrates these things. So now we are looking at the uh, Riccati tube model which we already derived in class a simple model and uh, it just uh, needs a representation of the acoustic field and some kind of expression for the heat release rate. So we saw we wrote the momentum and energy equations and then we did a model expansion we already worked this out in the class and we are attempting to get time domain solution because we are interested in seeing the transients and time domain is a very good way to look at the transients and uh, uh, we need a model for the heat release rate so we need to express the heat release rate fluctuations as a function of velocity but then there may be delays in the system in this case the delays uh, from the boundary load thermal and uh, momentum boundary layer of the wire. So there will be a delayed uh, uh, tau and so we say that the heat release is actually uh, a function of the velocity fluctuation at an earlier time that's t minus tau. Now you can you do not have to do this you can actually use CFD to solve the flow around the cylinder and calculate the heat release rate from those calculations uh, which is quite involved but I wanted to keep the problem as a toy problem very simple problem that is the reason I take this approach and uh, this is the correlation given by Heckel we uh, did this in fact we even linearized this in the class and derived a linear, uh, linearized operator and, and so on uh, and uh, I said that this uh, law enables us to get nonlinear terms important when u prime over u bar is of the order of one third and um, this Heckel says is what she sees in experiment debatable but this is what she says um, and then we can get something of the form like evolution equation as what people say uh, in dynamical systems theory uh, a d chi by d t plus some operator linear operator act acting on chi plus a non-linear operator acting on uh, non-linear function of chi is 0. So the linearized system will have only the first two terms um, so <coughs> and, and if there is uh, non-linearities you will have of course a non-linear function this kind of representation is uh, do you know what it is called uh, state space uh, state space representation in dynamical system theory also in uh, control theory. So we will look at some examples so we will run a calculation with no damping because the a lot of uh, theories and debates and controversies about damping so we just stay away we look at the undamped system. Uh, so I have given the parameters at the bottom of the screen you start with a small excitation and you see some kind of growth in velocity 
followed by dk okay so this like a, you can actually if you um, you are in a subcritical zone and you tap make a snap the fingers near a dk tube you can actually hear this now if you jack up the initial condition just a touch more uh, you actually get a different asymptotic state you are not actually going to a fixed point or not going to equilibrium or die down but here it's actually going to some kind of uh, limit cycle now if you oh, so this is a subcritical transition to instability which or combust instability people call it what is the name triggering triggering, triggering instability and if you look at the energy you can see that the um, so energy is a measure of how much fluctuation is there energy is a measure uh, now you see that uh, so this is the acoustic energy that are used um, scaled so uh, scale uh, uh, no, no this is not scale this is the acoustic energy and you see the linear uh, evolution it, it goes up and then we are looking at a subcritical system so eventually everything has to die down to zero and but the nonlinear system actually takes off and uh, goes to a high value where limit cycle is reached and uh, it's interesting to look at the phase we know that the uh, system doesn't have damping so as you reach the instability what should be the uh, value of phase as you reach limit cycle yeah why right so once you are in limit cycle there is no damping so there is no loss of acoustic energy and limit cycle means you are staying there you have uh, a constant energy so you do not need any driving also there is nothing going up nothing coming in and you already reach some level and you are just uh, staying there uh, so you can actually see in, um, though our model did not have damping we see a limit cycle in the absence of damping and we can also see that the phase is evolving to uh, something like 90 degree and, and, and so on okay so this is clear in that energy time diagram, yes. uh, those are two different systems, non linear. It is the same system, but I am running a non linear, there is a non linear system, I am linearizing the system and get a, linear, get a linearized operator and I am evolving that. So, it is the same system, but you are looking at it as a fully non linear system or a linearized version of the same system. So, they, they are in effect, there are two systems because one is a non linear system, one is a linear system, but uh, the basic thermoxy system we have a nonlinear model and what happens if you linearize it so in that sense they are same shouldn't nonlinearities come in after some uh, time like uh, after a amplitude like in this beginning or is so in the, the beginning the amplitudes are small so the nonlinear thing will essentially look like linear that's what is happening so oh, it's sum of uh, nonlinear plus yeah the nonlinear uh, evolution is the you take the nonlinear evolution and integrate forward and see what happens. So it has everything. A nonlinear simulation has linear and nonlinear. Oh, you are talking about subtracting one from the other. No, that's not what is done. Okay, very good point. So, uh, so you can see here at low amplitude, the trend of the nonlinear simulation is very similar to linear. So that means um, the uh, nonlinear terms are kind of uh, uh, they are getting significant as the as, as the time progresses as the amplitude increases. So, you are uh, absolutely right. Any other question? So, we will run a model including damping. We saw a model for damping. What was the model that we used? Entomo. No, no, an ento model is the model for heat release rate. We used a specific type of model. Which was like modal damping it was given by Matt View. So, uh, of this form for each mode is damped this way, and this is used by Matt View in his thesis on Ricci tube. And I think originally it is proposed by Stirling and Zukowski in 1991. Uh, so, we use that, and uh, we see that uh, same kind of transient growth followed by decay can be seen. And uh, so, you, you have a small initial condition, you have growth and decay, but a slightly different initial condition leads it to like a limit cycle. So, you can see that uh, triggering is occurring even if you choose some model of damping, but what model of damping to choose is I am sure it is very critical, but this is a model problem. So, I am putting in some uh, some model which is available.
so even the uh, energy evolution uh, does look very similar so you can see the linear evolution it has to die down because we are looking at by definition a subcritical system all eigen vectors are decaying because all eigen values show negative growth rate so it is dying but you the nonlinear system actually kind of follows the linear system for some time but then eventually it goes to a limit cycle so you don't necessarily have to get curves of this shape but the linear simulation if the eigen vectors are decaying has to die and the nonlinear one um, uh, so the other important thing is if you run the nonlinear simulation at low amplitude that will look very identical to the linear simulation okay because those nonlinearities which make the system take it out of the basin of attraction uh, has not really uh, uh, kicked in so once the transient growth has uh, gone so, over a limit then it will always go to nonlinear yeah so see so it's it's a uh, you have to watch let me go back to the picture here so you have a basin of attraction either you are out or in like bush says either you are with them or with me so either with your inside the basin of attraction or outside the basin of attraction but the linear mechanisms does cause some growth so it is not like the linear mechanism will make you jump out of the basin of attraction no either you are out of the basin of attraction or inside the basin of attraction but what the linear thing does is you it it flattens this or it, it smashes some part of the basin of attraction because uh, why is a smash because the linear mechanisms it, 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 see had it been a, a sphere it does not matter where you start with but because if you linearize the problem and look at it you can actually let us look at a 2D case um, it may be a highly distorted thing. So, this distance may be very large but this is very small so if you just uh, so you start off the, with this and you may be able to somehow grow here or something or get out that way so uh, uh, what this does is to so because the linear uh, linear mechanisms causing growth the level at which nonlinear is become important it different along different directions so along some uh, directions for example in this uh, punched potato uh, sorry uh, you may need only a small amplitude to be out of the basin of attraction. So, once you are out of the basin of attraction nonlinearities has to be taken into account, but even so along the from here linear mechanisms will are itself still operating and it is causing you to uh, grow. So, you have to view it in a little uh, imaginative and careful way. So, we cannot say that the linear mechanisms are making you go out of the basin of attraction you are always out of the basin of attraction if you are outside if you are in you are always in you cannot get in. But if non normality is there the basin of attraction would not look uniform because of this linear mechanisms causing growth is that clear that is one way to look at it. The other ways as you said uh, the non normalities can cause growth therefore uh, and it can you can have very significant growth and therefore you it may grow to values you may start with very small amplitude 1 percent or 0 0.1 percent but the linear mechanisms itself may make it grow to 10 percent or 20 percent. So, uh, just because you started out with small even with linear mechanism we can get very high. So, then uh, but at, at those amplitudes linearization will not be valid along those directions. So, you have to uh, be very careful in uh, figuring out at what amplitudes linearization is valid. So, basically non normality reduces the amplitudes at which linearization is valid or, or even at small amplitudes you can have uh, linearization fail and non linearity is being important. Right, and the uh, uh, you can uh, in a normal normal system, system can change direction in which it evolves. Okay, I mean you can evolve in any direction anyway, but as it changes direction, you can have growth. This is clear. Thank you for asking this. Any other questions? What determines the direction of this? Yeah, that is our next part, which is the best direction. Uh, uh, that that's what I'm going to talk. About. So I, I'll, I it will take half an hour to address, and that's what. I do not have own word answer. Any other questions? So, before I uh, go, I used to have, I, the whole idea came to me because I made a combustor in 90s and uh, it had uh, it was always uh, it, it, it was a tunable pulse combustor, it is still there in our lab, and I think maybe I can some of you have seen it. Uh, it actually uh, works from very low frequency from 
70, 80 hertz to 600, 700 hertz in that range. And uh, but you could never get it to work straight away in fundamental mode. Uh, but the student who was working, uh, his name is uh, Ram Narayan Balachandran. He is now a professor in U University College London. He had some kind of magic with which he could get it to work. So he would be working it under third mode, 200 and something hertz or something. Uh, and it's a bluff body combustor. So the position of the bluff body is very important. And with a sleight of hand, he will change the position of the bluff body and uh, this mode will die and the other mode will come up. So you can see here, this is the evolution of the velocity. It is actually a decaying system here, some uh, mode is dying. Uh, here in this case, some low frequency mode is dying and then a high frequency mode came. What he had was uh, the opposite uh, thing. And uh, if you see the projection on the modes, you can see that uh, the first mode is dying, but as it is dying, it is giving energy to this and this. So this is a subcritical system, eigenvectors all decay. And then this is about dead, but then these guys are giving energy back to it, it is going up like our Bollywood movies. Uh, the hero was kind when he was young and he helped everybody else, but then he was in a disaster and he was all set to die and then somebody comes and bails him out something. So some kind of thing is happening here, uh, but you do not have to look at it that way. But uh, you see, so a system if it is initially decaying, it does not mean it will continue to decay and can come, up, come back up, that is nonlinearities are there. Okay. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting to mention this. Now the question is, <coughs> as what he asked, how can you quantify energy growth? Vikram, right? Yeah. <coughs> so there are two things: only the direction and how much it is growing, right? And the growth definitely should depend on the uh, direction, as you are rightly pointed out. Because <coughs> if I, I, I showed the example last time that if you are exciting things around the eigenvector, then what happens? Will there be transient growth? That cannot be a transient growth because by definition the eigenvector is decay and if you do not have contribution along other eigenvectors, you just continue to decay. So from this example itself, it is abundantly clear that you have to, I mean the whole thing is the growth is directional dependent. If you are uh, along some direction, you may have transient growth, some other direction, you may not have transient growth at all. So the answer is uh, to quantify, you have to have a measure or a norm. And when I heard this uh, first, uh, this was my expression because I, I am not a mathematician or a physicist, and I can measure quantities, but I did not know understand. I did not understand what was a norm, so I had to, uh, you know, experiment. People who do experiments sometimes get thoroughly discouraged when they hear uh, fancy jargon. But soon I found out that there is nothing to worry about uh, because uh, uh, I, I'll explain to you because I understood pretty soon what it was. Uh, although the mathematician scared me with the talk of norm and measure and so on. I understood that uh, first I thought measure was a complicated thing, but then I understood that anything to measure you need a measure and it is just, just like English word, it is just that they write lemmas and theorems and throw you out. Uh, so uh, uh, two norm of a vector is nothing but its length in the Euclidean space. So we have a pencil or pen and I can measure the length. I do not call it two norm or measure or something like that, but all that needed is I have three coordinates and um, the uh, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 or x squared plus y squared plus z squared is the length, that is that, all, it is very simple, right. So, uh, so this is geometric space or normal space, Euclidean geometry. Uh, so you can have a three dimensional vector A uh, x i plus y j plus z k and the length is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So we want to extend this to something which has many components, let us say not just i j k, but 100 directions, 1000 directions. Now I cannot imagine 100 directions and 1000 directions, I can imagine 1, 2 and 3, but as long as I do not have to draw, I could accept that there could be several directions and you might have read books about 4 dimensional beings and 5 dimensional being and so on. So use your imagination, but assuming we have um, p dimensions here, then you could by extension we could construct a length which is like um, x1, you have a vector with p dimension x1, x2, x3 up to xp, then its norm will be x1 squared plus x2 squared plus ta -ta 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 up to xp squared. So uh, the two norm of a vector is nothing but its length if it is represented in a Euclidean space. So that is with this my fear was out and then I could deal with things. Any questions on this?
See, if you don't have a question, I have a question. What is the two norm of a matrix? We'll come to that. Huh? Matrix. Let's say square matrix. Hmm? Norm will be some number. Norm is like GPA, one thing to uh, distill everything that you are into 8.8 .8 or 9.3 or whatever. Okay, so we'll continue. For our vector space with Gellerkin modes, so we construct a space with our Gellerkin modes. Do we remember Gellerkin mode eta eta dot? Yeah, everybody remembers? Yeah? No. You remember? Okay. Sir, okay, cool. So we can think of it is like eta one cos kx plus eta one dot. Um, I mean the uh, the velocities were like eta one um, velocities were like cos or sine. Just check. I don't want to make a mistake. Yeah, pressure was like sine. So uh, velocities were like cos. So it was like. Uh, 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 well, velocity was like eta one cos uh, pi x plus eta two cos two pi x plus eta three uh, cos three pi x. So this cos uh, pi x cos two pi x cos three pi x, they are the basis function. They are like this i j k in our vector space. Okay, and, and uh, the uh, similarly eta one dot over k one, that's like the coefficient of sine j p x. They are also the basis functions. So these things are like the individual uh, vectors. So you have uh, you write the coefficients eta one eta one dot over k one eta two eta two dot over k two ta 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 up to eta n eta n dot over k n. Um, you, you can write it horizontally and put a transpose instead of writing a vector um, safe space. So if you take the norm, it will be eta eta i squared plus eta i over k k i squared right uh, summation over all the modes. So that is the uh, norm of our uh, vector space with covering this Gellerkin modes. Is that clear? Yeah. So uh, acoustic energy, it is a non-dimensional one and of course when you non-dimensionalize, you can non-dimensionalize with different constants. So the expression you see in papers would change a little bit, uh, but it goes like p prime squared plus u prime squared scaled by some factors. Now the thing is this norm is like a constant times the energy, which is what we need. If you scale it some other way, you would not get it proportional to energy. So we have to scale it that way such that the norm is like proportional to energy. Then only the measure makes sense because we are looking at the energy of the system, right. See uh, I mean when they scale the GPS they multiply the theory courses by 4 credit and lab courses by 2 credit or something like that. Uh, so the idea is that uh, the other thing is you put more effort so you have to scale the grade uh, more and uh, scale the other one less or something like that. So you have to scale such that you get what you want. But a guy may be extremely good at laboratory but may be very poor at passing exams. So this scaling will not reflect the skills. But there if you weigh his lab thing by 10 credit and theory by 1 credit, he will come out on top. So what you get is what you give in norm. So there is no perfect answer to what norm you should use. In this problem, it is kind of obvious to use acoustic energy, but it is not at all that obvious for many complicated problems. But the basic thing is what you get is what you give is what you get or something like that. What, what, what you make is what you get. But in this case, the two norm of a state vector represents the acoustic energy. So I hope this is clear. Acoustic energy goes like pressure squared plus velocity squared. So I uh, got the slides from Peter Schmidt who has given me permission to use them. Uh, so if you, you can write this formally as if Q is the, uh, it is a nice thing because sometimes some history is good uh, from some stalwart uh, has written it. So dQ or dt is LQ. So if it is a ordinary differential equation, how do you, uh, what is the solution? It will be like E power LT times Q naught. The same solution works for matrix. So you can uh, write E power LT where L is a matrix times Q naught. So the question is what is meant by matrix exponential. I think many of you know this, but I will uh, do this formally here because some people ask me. So 
so we look at exponential of a matrix so we know the expansion e power x equal to sigma k equal to 0 to infinity x power k over k factorial which is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus. So now let us construct this for a matrix. So let us say, um, so assuming that if we can follow the definition as long as we can calculate x squared x cube x power 4 then we can actually construct the exponential because you can make all these powers then add up and construct this exponential of a matrix right. So as long as we can solve the power. So if a equal to lambda 0 0 mu then a power k would be equal to lambda power k 0 0 mu power k. This you can multiply it out and see it and then or prove by induction or, or whichever way you want. So uh, now the issue is so then if you have this then you can simply add up all these things there is no problem. But the issue is what if B is uh, non-diagonal okay. So let us say B is non-diagonal so but then you can say we can always make this transform what is this called so this transformation huh? similarity. similarity transformation right. So how do you find this? How do you get the similarity? So you look for the eigenvalue, right? And then you can calculate the similarity from the eigenvalue. The eigenvalue. So, Can um, expand out with this. You substitute this for this, and then you can expand out this way. And now it's quite simple. So this will become one plus t inverse a t plus. What would this become? Again, it will become t inverse a square t plus. What would this become? T and t inverse will go. T and t inverse will go. So it will become a times a times a. So it will again be t inverse a cubed t plus t inverse a power k t plus so one can be written as like t inverse t so t inverse i t right i is one 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 so this can be recast as t inverse times one plus a plus a squared over 2 factorial plus ah thank you a cube by 3 factorial t inverse. So this would be equal to t inverse e power a times t okay. So this would be make things formal yeah. Will only exist if the are independent. Okay. As long as you can find a, as long as you can do this decomposition, we can do this. Okay. But you are saying that if you are repeated eigenvalues, you cannot do this. Why? 
then why won't take this? Because he, then the matrix will be singular, the eigenvector matrix. Ah, two determinant matrix. Okay. Yeah, fine. Mm. But uh, in, okay, if so as long as you can get this um, uh, transform, then you can do this. So, so we want to look at uh, energy at time, some time divided by energy at some time t equal to 0 and that would go like norm of this e power t times l, l is the linear operator here. Okay. So, now this comes back to my question as to how do you get the uh, norm of the matrix. Yeah. Okay. So, before that, so in summary, so we want to find in our uh, in our notation uh, norm of chi at t uh, divided by norm of chi at uh, uh, 0, I mean squared. So, you can define norm as square or without square. So, this is the way I think I have seen it used by physicists. So, they put uh, if you have you have to put square then norm squared is like energy but the other people they sometimes you don't put square so just have to be uh, be consistent with the notation so uh, what you need to find out is the greatest possible energy growth at time t and we should be able to optimize it over all initial perturbations so you have perturbation along various directions as you pointed out considering all the perturbations available which one gives the maximum growth that is the idea so we want to maximize that so uh, so at you want to optimize over the initial condition and uh, find this energy ratio or, or the ratio of the norms and then we have to optimize it for all times and then you can get the maximum possible transient growth is that clear so you have to at each time you have to maximize it over all initial conditions and then so these maximas you maximize it over all times pick the one which gives the maximum over all times that is the maximum possible transient growth and the corresponding initial condition is the one that gives the maximum tension growth. Okay. Now, how do you do this that is the idea uh, would you have to integrate along take all possible initial condition and try to integrate is that what you should do or is there something available in linear algebra which you can use to address this that is the next question. So, uh, we go back again uh, just to recap dk by dt is l chi so chi of t is e power minus l t times chi of 0. So I bring this l to the other side it becomes minus l chi. So we need the two norm of this um, matrix e power minus l t that is the crux of the matter. The two norm of any matrix is its principal singular value that is the way it is defined. Okay. Now there is a reason why it is defined that way, which you will see now I mean people are smart in defining this way. So we need to do singular value of a matrix A. So, I wonder if you know what is singular value decomposition do you know no ok. So, uh, if you have any matrix A we can write this as u sigma v transpose now. So, what is the big deal about this u is a unitary matrix v transpose which is the transpose of v it is also unitary matrix and sigma is the matrix with non negative numbers on its diagonal and zeros of diagonal okay so in principle if you have a matrix a we can rewrite it as u sigma v transpose now how to do that i will explain afterwards okay i mean how to practically calculate this sigmas but let's assume that we can do this is that okay so the idea here is that let's attempt to do a singular value decomposition of our evolution operator so back to our differential equation dk by dt plus l chi 0 and just to remind that uh, this is the state vector eta on and eta on over uh, e eta dots and eta dot over j pi's the, that, that vector and solution is chi t is e power minus l t times chi naught and so we have to do s v d of e power minus l t. So, uh, chi t is so we, we replace e power minus l t with u sigma v transpose okay. assuming we have e power l t minus l t and we do SVD and you get u sigma v transpose and we have just put it back that is all nothing more than that just replaced e power minus l t with u sigma v transpose in this equation that is all. Okay. 
but this has a profound physical meaning which answers the question Vikram asked. Uh, so, let us see uh, uh, what this means, I have just rewritten this. So, V transpose chi naught actually resolves the initial condition vector in the orthonormal basis of input vectors. We saw that V transpose is a unitary uh, matrix. So, it this actually resolves the initial condition vector into orthonormal basis of input vectors and the whole thing uh, in, in representative of the u, u times something, it represents the output vector as a linear superposition of components along the orthonormal basis formed by the output vectors. Okay. So, we multiply the matrix from right with V. Okay. We have e power minus L T as u sigma V transpose and when you multiply a matrix with something, uh, see when you multiply 1 with 2, you can have 1 first or 2 first does not matter but in a matrix you have to multiply either from the left or from the right and both can give different answers and they will give same answer only under very special conditions. So, here I am emphasizing that I am multiplying from the right side. So, when I multiply this V transpose with V what happens it becomes identity. So, I have E power minus L T times V is U sigma V transpose V which is U sigma because V transpose is unitary. So, if you take the evolution operator and it acts on v1 which is this column one of the columns of the eigen uh, of the singular vectors so this is the most in, so e power lt when it acts on the uh, most sensitive input direction will give a sigma 1 is the maximum possible gain um, and the direction will be u1 will be the most sensitive output directions so this would be the uh, uh, interpretation where sigma 1 is the uh, principal singular value so, singular values when they are returned, they are returned in the descending order. The highest one will come first, the next highest will be next, the next highest will be next and so on. So, the top one is the uh, principal singular value and this is the one with the maximum magnitude. So, this is the machinery in linear algebra available. So, when you line, uh, study linear algebra, it is just operations, but it is set up such that it you, uh, or I do not know who set it up which first, but it has a physical meaning in terms of studying energy growth we can use that machinery here. The only uh, critical thing is your norm should mean something physical that you care. So, let us look at in terms of this uh, matrices. So, A is acting on V and V consists of various columns. So, let us take the first column okay, that is corresponding to this one V 1 here. <coughs> now, this is equal to U 1 times sigma 1. So, this is how it look in a matrix is that clear. So, in, in a matrix structure uh, this line actually means the first column. So, here it will return the first column and you have to multiply it by this that that is the meaning of this equation. Okay. So, we are doing again I must acknowledge Peter Schmidt for giving this nice illustration to me and giving me permission to use this. So, uh, you take S V D of E power L T which you write as U sigma V transpose or H here means Hermitian conjugate, but same as transpose. So, E power L T acts on operate this operates on V 1 and you will get U 1 times norm of the uh, uh, E power L T. Okay. So, that is the amplification. This is the same as what I wrote, but you can see it kind of pictorially in terms of the columns of the matrix. And uh, sorry, this uh, this line actually means this is the uh, uh, this is the one which is non negative and everything else is 0 in this uh, matrix. Yeah. So, e power l t operates on input then you get amplification times e power output. So, uh, you have this operator and these are the different direction that are available. So, we are discretized the system in some sense. So, actually infinite dimensional system we are discretized into this eta eta on uh, eta dots and etas and so on. So, you have finite number. So, there are finite number of directions, but this when you do the S V D this is the optimum initial condition it is the uh, left principal singular vector and that would be the gain times the optimal final direction is the 
uh, sorry uh, right principal singular vector. So, the evolution operator operates on the left principal singular vector it will give the uh, right principal singular vector times the gain okay. clear. So, principal singular value in effect gives the maximum energy amplification and the corresponding right singular vector is the most sensitive initial condition. So, let us look at uh, uh, g max is infinity that means, energy is amplified to infinity when does it happen that happens for classical linear instability g max is 1 that means, you had the maximum energy at time t equal to 0 ever since then it is decaying. So, that is classical stability I mean you uh, you have eigen let us say you have excitation along eigen mode and it just decays and that is fine. G max greater than 1, but finite. So, this is transcendent. So, even a n tau model of Kroko, we have done some calculation, and this is like in the parametric space we have plotted versus flame location versus n, and you can see uh, this the scale to read complete white is G max is infinity, complete black is uh, G max is 1. So, this pitch white portions are linearly unstable region complete dark is linearly stable and in between there is a gray which is regions of transient growth. Same here in this region there is uh, linear instability in this region it is uh, classical stability and in between there is a region where there is transient growth. So, the regions of stability instability and potential instability. Huh? Yeah, so uh, you have regions here in which uh, so what I have plotted is contour maps of G max. So, when G max is 1 that means there is no growth or anything. So, that is this region and of course, I cannot show infinite gray scale human beings cannot see it and I do not know to represent it. So, up to 6 I have gray, but after that I have put white which means it uh, and white corresponds to infinity. So, if you use this model you know we have done this already there are regions where th this is linearly unstable. So, this complete white denotes linearly unstable region here also and complete dark denotes um, classical linear stability and in between there are shades of gray which would actually mean there are uh, finite g max like g max of 4, 5 and all that for this model for some other model you may have larger or smaller. So, uh, so I can call this as regions of stability, instability and potential instability perhaps. So now, oh, location of the flame, XF. So shouldn't that uh, it should be some skewed kind of? Yeah. So it, it, it not only the amount of acoustic driving depends on the uh, n and tau or the heat release rate, but see Q is a function of u, but then u and p are also related, and what you want is the phase between Q and p. Okay. So, or just a second. Yeah, right. So let me explain this. So we want p prime q prime. So q prime is, let's say, uh, goes like u prime uh, times g. So, we it just does not depend only on g, but it also depends on the phase between p prime and u prime or if I yeah it, it depends on the phase between p prime and uh, u prime the amount of driving. So, this critically affects this. So, that is the re reason why x f is an important parameter. So, it is not just 
n being large or small, but what is the phase between pressure and velocity and then velocity and uh, its gain when the heat gain or the heat release. Shouldn't it uh, be there? Should be some uh, x values mm. where even at low n, yeah. it goes to instability. Yeah, it's possible. So, but it, it's not. Seen. Yeah, I mean, uh, see, this is like a gray is increasing, right? I mean, so I mean, it is not like flat contours. Yeah. It is in a very complex shape, I can't really interpret, but yeah, it is possible, very much possible. So, the uh, uh, I just want to uh, stop with explaining how to obtain singular values, how to compute singular values. A transpose would be u sigma v transpose transpose. This would be u sigma transpose. No, v transpose transpose, which is v times u sigma transpose. This is equal to v sigma transpose u transpose. Is that right? So I should probably write. So let us take A A transpose, this is U sigma V transpose multiplied by V sigma transpose U transpose. So what is this? Hmm? Yeah, so this would be U sigma sigma transpose U transpose. So, this can be rewritten as u transpose inverse sigma sigma transpose u transpose. So, what transformation is this of A A transpose is this? That is a similarity transform. So, <coughs> that means this is the this will contain the eigen values of A A transpose. So, if it is a square matrix sigma square will contain eigen values of A A transpose. So, the way to get singular values of a matrix A is to multiply it by its transpose and obtain the eigen values that will give the square of the singular values it's very simple and if you are using matlab you can have just commands to do all this okay i am out of time so I'll stop here so we looked at uh, the uh, evolution of the operator and we looked at the linear evolution of a dynamical system and we saw those analytical solution and then we tried svd and then we found that we could find the uh, optimal initial condition and the maximum energy amplification using SVD. So, we will stop here. Next. Time.